Welcome to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. I am in a super good mood today, and I am so glad you're with me. I am your host. I am also a life transition coach, so my work is all about helping people deal with change. And Lord knows we've all been through a lot of change since March of last year. And what often happens with change is, you know, something's got to go for for something to be different. And so with change often comes loss. And with loss, most often comes grief. And so my work is about helping people deal with that unwelcome change, deal with the upheaval that it might cause in their life, the discomfort or other ways that grief sometimes manifests itself, which could be sadness and depression, could be anxiety, could be sleeplessness, it could be unwanted fears. We never really know how grief is going to rear its many heads. (laughs) It has many faces, and it can show up differently, even for the same person with different losses. But we all have our own unique way of dealing with loss. So that's my work in my private practice, helping people deal with those changes, those life transitions. And then, of course, I have the privilege of bringing this show to you so we can try and reach out to many people to help them with the issues life brings them that may be baffling or overwhelming. I am also an author. I have written a book called Chakras, the Magnificent Seven. I have written a book called Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? And my most recent book, and one of my favorites, I have to say, is this little book called Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say. Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say is a a very succinct way of helping people who are well-meaning, who want to show up to help their friends who are dealing with some kind of a loss or some kind of a disturbance in the force, if you will, and they don't know what to say. So too often they don't show up. They don't show up. They're not there. And then that sad person, the one going through the upheaval, is left feeling lonely and abandoned. So saying the right thing when you don't know what to say actually gives you a lot of sentences that are great to say, a, a, a mindset to come from that really helps, and it gives you also an equally long list of what's not helpful to say. And sometimes that could be the most important list that people really need to take a look at. I am also a speaker, and I love to speak on many topics. Talking Sometimes we talk about how to eliminate limiting beliefs because I'm a founding member of the Association of Comprehensive Energy Psychology. So my work uses those tools also, and a lot of mind-body tools. If you would like to know more about my work, you can find that information on paulashaw.com. And also, while you're there, be sure to grab the free gift, which is a PDF of 20 things to say and 20 things not to say to people in emotional pain. All righty. So in this fall season, we've been kind of working with the theme of resiliency. And that came to me because after living for over a year now, well over a year, in a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic situation, we've all experienced change, loss, 
upheaval, and a lot of things that have been very, very difficult for many of us. And it occurred to me that the way back from loss is resiliency. And so I'm just loving focusing my interviews this fall season around that word, resiliency. And I think it means many things to many people, but it's it's a ability to bounce back. It's an ability to recreate. It's an ability to see the light at the end of the tunnel and know that something good is out there that you can reach for and that can help you get through the turbulent seas that you may be trying to navigate in the present moment. And my guest today is a dear, dear friend and someone who is precious to me on many levels, but he's also precious to the world in that he is a vehicle, if you will, through which many people strengthen their resiliency, particularly after the loss of death. But it could be any kind of a loss because Eddie Connor, who I'm about to introduce you to, gives people hope and he shows them that there's another way. He shows them that it's all bigger than just us and what we're going through right now. He shows us that we're all connected. And I am so delighted to be connected to him. So before I bring him out to introduce him to you, let me tell you a little bit about him. Eddie Connor is a soul intuitive. He's a radio host and the host of Coming Out with Liz and Eddie. It's a podcast. He has appeared on so much television that if I name all the shows, there won't be time to interview him. But uh, a few, The Morning Show Australia, CNN.com, Associated Press, America's Best TV Show, and trust me, many, many more. He's been featured in CBSLocal.com for one of the best psychics and mediums in Los Angeles. And his newly released book, The Gift Within Us, in that book, he has been named one of the top psychics in the world. And I personally will attest to that. So, Eddie, let's don't keep them waiting any longer. Please join me. Hi. There he is, <laughs> the man of the hour. No, oh my goodness. Hi. Hello. And you know, I forgot to tell them, Eddie and I actually met many years ago because we had a client in common. And I, at that time in my life, this is many years ago, didn't really understand Eddie's work. And so our client was an older woman, and I had really taken her under my wing because she literally, when she first came to my first grief group, she was afraid to leave the house. And the only way she could get to the grief group is that one of my assistants picked her up and would walk her to the car and walk her into the room. She was a precious fabulous woman that Eddie and I both love. And in fact, I think the last time I saw you in person was at her celebration of life. That's right. But I went to meet Eddie because I wanted to check him out and make sure that she was safe because she loved him and so cherished the things that he told her. And I could see he was helping her to feel safer in the world, but I wanted to be sure he was the real deal. And may I say to everybody, Eddie Connor is the real deal. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, you, <laughs> I, I think of this beloved person, this friend of ours, all the time. And one mm-hmm. of the particular ways I feel like I get signs from her is when I see those little planes fly by around the city where I live uh-huh. because 
she went from being agoraphobic oh, yes. at the beginning of you two working together. And then she started flying planes. Yes. And then she I'm flew getting to chills, New- total body chills. And she flew to New Zealand. Uh-huh. And I mean, I'm like, she literally went from where she was to continuing to just embrace uh, things that people in their totally. 20s, 30s, 40s would never do. It's so true. Remember when she dyed her hair purple? She put a little purple in her hair. <laughs> she, and it was a big deal. And she owned it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I remember See, that day. You know, when- I think you and I should have had this conversation years ago. We can do some crazy good work together. I'm telling you, it's my favorite homogenizing of, that's one of my favorite things to do. Everyone who loves what they do in their field of expertise all coming together. Yes. And and yet right now I feel like what's going on, not to jump the script or anything, but there's (laughs) two predominant frequencies I've noticed in the last 12 months, especially Mm. it's either a unifying thought, feeling, or frequency, or habit, or it's a separating Uh. thought, feeling, or habit, or action, and there's no real gray there. Mm. It's either this or this. You know, now that you say that, I'm really feeling that too. I'm feeling it in relationships. You know, it's like we're either like bonding and we're good for life or I'm reconnecting with people who were dear to me years ago, Mm -hmm. or you're just seeing that the differences are, are insurmountable and it's more comfortable to just disconnect. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I love that. Mm -hmm. So Eddie. I know that you know the word resiliency inside and out, and and you've known it since childhood. So would you share with our listeners a little bit about your own life experience that taught you about this concept of resiliency? I, for me personally, it was watching my mom. And I grew up a, a kid in the 60s in rural North Carolina, literally John Boy Walton right off the turnip truck. <laughs> and we, it, back then, it was a totally different world. And so mm-hmm. we were poor white trash, which means we were nothing. Mm-hmm. And my mom would not let that be our reality. And we were poor. Mm -hmm. And we were white and we lived in our trailer park and we lived in the projects. She said, you will always keep your chin up. And she's like, it's not what you got in the bank. It's what you carry right here. And it's how you treat other people. So you Mm -hmm. treat everybody like you. And this is in the South during segregation. And then the beginning of the integration process, she said, I don't care. You treat everybody the same. Now, my stepdaddy was not on the same page. (laughs) <laughs> so there was that torn between authorities. Uh, and so I watched mom's resilience as mostly physical in the beginning because she had to fight to keep her four boys from being beat up by my birth dad and then my stepdad. Uh, and then she put, kept it all together for us, it seemed like. And so she would fight and fight and fight um, to survive. But then as I got around seven to 10 years old, I realized it was this thing she had inside of her that caused her to do that. It was love to make sure we were okay. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no one's going to tell me who I am. Uh And no one's going to hold me down because of what title I was given by somebody that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And that struck me to the core. And so Mm -hmm. getting a little older and then finding out, realizing I'm gay Mm -hmm. in the South, in the Bible Belt, I had to then adopt 
organically what I saw my mom go through. And then I ended up couturing it to who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. So I don't like confrontation. I don't like combativeness because of what I watched my mom deal with growing yes. up. Yes. And I wasn't your stereotypical white trash trailer park kid in the mm -hmm. 60s. I was this sensitive kid that didn't want to go hunting. I didn't want to kill animals. I wanted to decorate the trailer for Christmas. Um, I wanted to make everybody feel good. I wanted yeah. everybody to connect. And so I was immediately the outsider. So my resiliency, when I tapped into it from the inside out, came. it always came back to humor, lightness, and a way to unify Um even if I had the title of being gay, even if I had the title of being trash, if I had the title of being whatever, then my beingness as who I knew that I knew that I knew I was would trump eventually their perspective of me based on what somebody else said or did. So tell me, Eddie, when you were young, did you figure that out when you were young? Did you have a sense that... I'm meant for bigger things or I'm meant to make a mark in the world. Was there something that you knew in your in your heart and soul that helped buoy you through all that? I I I had these knowings. I didn't know where they came from. Mm -hmm. um, I also saw ghosts. I saw angels. I heard disincarnate voices. I saw shadow figures. So I had that whole thing going on. And, of course, I was just the over-imaginative child uh -huh. who was having bad dreams in broad daylight. Um, and one time, my dad my dad would get home before my mom, my stepdad, mm -hmm. and he would be like, and... I and I was sensitive as you I I was so sensitive and I would keep it together and then I would say okay dad I'm going to go out and mow the yard and as soon as I got out of his eyesight I would start crying uh, and it was just always the quiet cry never the mm -hmm. ugly cry because <laughs> you, know, you had to you had to be two people in one yes and I I was walking around the creek and mowing the grass. And you pick all the stuff up in the yard first and throw it in the woods and then you go mow. And I was like, I hate this. I hate being sensitive. I hate seeing these things. I hate being bullied for these things. And as clear as a bell. And it was a voice outside of me and inside of me simultaneously. And it was a feeling voice that said, your sensitivity will be your trademark in helping other people mm. not feel these things when you get older. Uh. And it was a knowing, and immediately I just knew that I knew that I knew, and I was lifted up. And of course, when you're a kid, you want it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Because you've been having it yesterday, we'll fix everything. Um, <laughs> But that's when I knew for a fact that I wasn't damaged, broken um, in any way, that it was something that once I learned to own it, harness it, and quite frankly, love it, mm -hmm. then I, I, the doors and the windows would open for my life purpose. And with it, which is what you've already said is, I had this absolute then sense that came with it that I would go from where we lived here to something very different and something much better. Not that living in a house is better than living in a trailer. I'm talking about inside. Right, yeah. right. So how were you viewed by the people around you? Were you the weird kid? Were you the one that everybody was a little worried about? Or did they understand? Did they accept you? did not understand uh 99 did not accept my mom was psychic her mother was psychic oh. and i was psychic ah. and my other grandmother would spend sometimes in mental institutions oh uh, for schizophrenia i allegedly that's what i've heard because i don't 
uh, we're still, we don't talk to that side of the family. Or we didn't then. I, my aunt Sue, now I love her. And so it, mom would say to me affectionately, she's like, Edward, you're my weird child, aren't you? <laughs> and I was like, I think I am, mom. And she said, I, I think you are too. She would tell me stories about how I would be sitting and playing with myself all day as a toddler and as a little kid. And I was playing with my twin sister who didn't make it into the earth plane. Oh. And but as I got older, older, and going into junior high school, I, some kids jumped my brothers and me at the bus stop. And out of the clear blue in the middle of this fight, I said, your bus is going to turn over and send every one of you to the hospital. And everything come to a dead halt. And then oh the airbus came and picked them up and left. And everybody's looking at me like I'm a character from a Stephen King novel. And then our bus came and picked us up for senior high school. And on the way to school, you know how kids are on a school bus? They're like, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. all of a sudden it goes. So I just stayed like this, and pretended to read my book because I'm still freaked out. And then the bus gets super quiet. And then I see everybody get up and move to the left side of the bus. And I looked over and they're looking back at me mm. and out the window and back at me and out the window. And I'm like, what? And Brenda Jones said their bus turned over. Oh, my God. And your brothers and those boys are on, at the ambulance. And our bus oh. had to go slow past because it, their bus was hit by a tractor trailer. And so there was busted glass all over the road in the morning mm. sun was coming up. So it looked like a fairy tale nightmare. Oh. And they looked, that was the tipping point where it's like, okay, he's the weirdo. Let's sort of keep away. Oh, my word. Yeah. Very oh. cool in the childhood. <laughs> oh. Well, you know what, Eddie? Maybe that's a good spot for us to just take a quick break, and then we'll come back to <laughs> hopefully that that all went uphill from there. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw and my guest today, Soul Intuitive Eddie Connor my dear friend for so many years, and an incredibly gifted man. So if you're just joining us, Eddie was just talking about childhood when he first began to realize he had these intuitive gifts. He actually could see things before they happened. And that's a load for a kid, isn't it, Eddie? How old were you when this bus thing happened, when the bus turned over? I was in the ninth grade when that particular thing happened, yeah. Okay. And so what happened from there? When? How did you reach a point where you kind of really came to peace with your gifts and then actually worked on developing them? It was such a good question, Paula. Uh, it, it was shortly after that incident where I would see, it's like all of the predictions I saw or felt were all bad. Mm. Because we grew up in a volatile environment. Exactly. So I was the guy who saw, I was, I was taught through osmosis to see everything as a fight. And the glass is half empty. Oh. And blah, blah, blah. On the other hand of side of that is never act like you don't have anything. Always keep your chin up. So it was it was a contradicted message. Yes. Um and so I saw more things happen and then I said, I don't want this anymore. Whatever this thing is, I hate it. I don't want it. And it literally went away. Oh no kidding. It went away. I don't I don't I didn't have any more experiences until I was 20, between 20 and 21 years old. Mm -hmm. I was babysitting that day. So I was driving the Karen's station wagon around the block and was hit and, and T-boned by another car at an intersection and taken to the hospital. 
And when I was T-boned, it's like every it's like what everybody says. Everything starts in slow motion. I could see the car coming. I knew that it, we were going to impact. And I was pulled out of my body uh -huh. um, and up and up and up. And then I saw everything from up here looking down in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And I saw everybody and felt everybody's feelings around because they were just getting out of the textile mills. And everybody's like, oh, my God. And I saw my body being thrown into the floorboard of the passenger side Ooh. of the uh. car. And then my entire life flashed before my eyes. Wow. My birth dad, whom at the time I hated. Mm -hmm. My stepdad, whom at the time I hated. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, my mother's mother at the time I hated. And the reason I hated them was because they made my mother's life a living hell. Um, and every one step forward she made in life, they all made sure she was pulled back five more, which uh, made her more resilient. And that's where I learned life isn't fair, as it were. But when I rose above it, I knew what it all meant. I knew that, that was, it was a movie being played out in my life. Mm -hmm. I knew that on a soul level, all three of them loved me. I knew on a soul level, we were supposed to have this dance. And I knew on a soul level, I was supposed to go forward in my life and do what I'm doing today. I knew that that was the tipping point. I needed the wake up call. And I've never felt as much love and likeness and purpose in my entire 20 years on planet earth as i did in that moment wow. and then when i was going back down into my body i was like now don't forget this amnesia is a real thing yeah. don't forget this and that was the tipping point. And that was when everything started moving faster and faster. So at 21, 22, I started my spiritual path. And fast forward to in 1995, they brought me out to Los Angeles, threw me on the radio, you know, Southern Fried Psychic giving predictions off the watermelon truck. <laughs> and it went over really good. And I moved out here. Wow. Here. And it all began right there. It did. And oh any my time I get my big boy panties and a wad, I have to remember, I will go back and remember the love from that accident. Mm. Oh, my goodness. So you started, you know what, Eddie, I, it occurs to me that some of our listeners may not really understand how an intuitive gets the information they get. And I remember you and I had this conversation once long ago, but could you explain a little bit about that? Like, like when you saw that bus turning over or, you know, when you're doing sessions, because you do do private sessions with people and we'll be sure and give them information about that. You know, I know you've pulled down information that's gone into your books which I forgot to mention the titles of, but I know my okay. fave was the first one I ever owned about the big butt syndrome. Yeah. So I'll have you give those book titles in, in just a moment. But how do you get this info, Eddie? What's your line with spirit? My line with spirit is one all of us have. We all have it. Mm -hmm. And my particular line is I'm more of a clairvoyant, which means I see things intuitively in my mind's eye. Okay. And then I'll hear things clairaudiently in my sort of my temples, but not my ears. Um, I'm a knower. I just know things. Like when I said in the ninth grade to those boys, your bus is going to turn over and send every one of you to the hospital. That wasn't a... I didn't hear it and I didn't see it. That was a, a knowing thing. It just burst ah. out of me. Mm -hmm. um, it, I was as shocked as everybody else was. And then I'm a feeler and a sensor. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So you just feel things, but you don't know, you have no point of reference. Yes. So if you don't see or hear it first and then feel it, sense it, mm-hmm. I'm a little lost. So I'm a seer, hearer, that's my strength. And then a knower, third, and a feeler, sensor, fourth and fifth, and a medium right in the middle. And a medium talks to dead people. And I am truly an accidental medium. I am the small (laughs) medium at large who is just grasping onto any little micro piece and going, I think his name is John. Uh, (laughs) They're called... I, it's not my strength at all, but people who come to a psychic to tune into your energy, they want to talk to usually somebody who's passed away. Sure. Oftentimes that is the case. And in my own work, because, you know, I, I work with a lot of grieving people. Um, I have seen people who were absolutely paralyzed with grief Mm. once a message came through from the person that they lost and it was undisputable. Like nobody could have known this. They, the idea, because what I always teach my clients since I come from the energy perspective and, and the energy psychology as well, I teach them that energy cannot be created or destroyed. All the energy that ever will be and ever has been is right here, right now, but it can change forms. So what I teach them is when somebody transitions, their energy, the energy that made up Paula Shar, Eddie Connor, is still there, that soul, if you will, but it just changes forms. Well, that's kind of an ethereal concept until someone has the experience that a loved one who is gone now communicates with them and then they realize, oh, wow, they are still there. That, that energy, that beingness exists. And that I've seen to be so powerful. It, it's one of those things, it comes to, it comes back to a feeling of you know that you know that you know. Yes. When you receive that, what I, I can remember laying on the floor at my grandma's house mm-hmm. next to the wood stove, flicking wolf spiders off of me oh. and watching Tony Curtis in the movie Houdini, mm. where he, you know, he explored mediumship all over the world. And he loved to debunk mediums. Now, his problem was... If you didn't say what he wanted to hear, he would also debunk you. Oh. And so on his birthday, he'd get a reading. And if uh, they never said to him, oh, such and such says happy birthday, yeah, he would call them a charlatan. But oh. I can remember laying on the floor in elementary school watching this movie because Tony Curtis was cute, let's face it. <laughs> and so it was Janet Lee. And I was laying on the floor and I said, when I grow up, And I, in these loved ones or these beings come, come in around me. You have to give me things that no one on earth knows, but the person I'm talking to Mm. so that I was selfish then. So I don't feel crazy. (laughs) So I know I'm not making it up. Right. You in your line of work, the number one thing that this the people who have passed over will often say. And by the way, dead people love to reference the movie Ghost. Oh, how funny! They oh, that's honestly, hysterical. <laughs> they really do because that the psychic medium that worked with them to make that as authentic as possible. She was you know, hell bent and determined to make sure it portrayed spirit as best as possible. Mm. But the number one thing a loved one will often say, not long after they've passed away is, I, I'm still here. And t- like today, she was slicing avocado. And she was making a salad and she fed the birds and she was crying under the orange tree. And they're like, yes, 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 and yes, but why didn't you show yourself to me? And they say that 
Every time you feel me, sense me, or hear me, Mm. you fall into deep grief. And Mm. I am not allowed to be around you if I keep causing you deep grief. You have to go through your steps. I will be here, but not so close that you fall into deep grief. Yes. And they'll reference the movie. Each time Molly was in the deep part, she couldn't hear Sam weep to save her life. Mm -hmm. But as soon as she started waking up, understanding how it works, and believing without resistance that there is an afterlife, it got really good. You know, another way that I look at that too, Eddie, um, many years ago, a book was written called In Death We Do Not Part. And it was written by a man who had loved, had this beautiful love affair with his wife, and she died very suddenly. Mm. But then he discovered that he, she began speaking with him beyond, you know, beyond the grave, so to speak. And he started channeling her, he would ask her questions and she would give him the answers and he would write them. And that's the content of this book. Well, they asked me as a grief expert to read it and perhaps give an endorsement. And one of the things that he said, or that she told him in the book, because they asked me, do you want to ask a question yourself? And I said, you know, why is it that some people seem to be able to connect with people on the other side and others can't. And one of the things they said is when you're grieving, Mm. your vibration is very slow and dense because of the sadness and the pain. Beings on the other side are vibrating at this very high level. So it's hard for them to connect with you when you're in that depth of grief and sadness. And that's why so many people have had experiences where the car starts honking or the radio turns on or that kind of thing, because the vibration of electrical devices is higher and closer to where they are. Yeah. And when you're in grief, your electromagnetic frequency is low, low, low. You couldn't write a a nightlight when it's that low. Yes. And so then they can affect the TV, the light bulb, the cell phone, or whatever it is. Yes. Um, I love that. The word medium also comes from our energy as humans is down here. Their energy as non-physical beings is here. They lower their energy to connect with us, but we have to raise our energy to connect with them. And that's where the word medium comes from. Yes. Oh my gosh, Eddie, I, I could talk to you for three days and I'm, and there's so much that we have to talk about, but I, I want to, I don't want to end our time together without letting you maybe share with our listeners, what do you think are some of the most important or, or effective or what are some of the things we can do to increase our resiliency, to give us hope, to help us get back on the horse once we've been knocked off? Wow, great question. I I really, resiliency in and of itself has a range. Mm -hmm. So if we have this much resiliency and we apply it, we will get results. But if we have this level of resiliency from the inside out, my mom's resiliency was physicality, Uh pushing the boulder up the side of the mountain. I'll get in your face. You're in my face. I'll get back in your face. And so she would go toe to toe, tooth to tooth, claw to claw. Yes. And it's survival, survival, survival. But I didn't understand that inside was mama bear and that's love that's desire and there is a belief that you will not f with me i will f with you right back to protect my cups right and so then as i got older i realized the inside out part of it and per your great question the number one 
most powerful thing, in my opinion, with core essence resiliency is you amp up your desire and you amp up your belief to match that desire and mountains will move for you. So mm-hmm. the desire isn't enough by itself. Mm-hmm. And you have to line up the desire in the brain, in the heart, and in the gut. Mm-hmm. If your desire is a 10 in the head, the heart, and the gut, and your belief is, I don't think so, mm-hmm. and it's not but a four and a three and a one, you will get results, but you will not get results. Yes. So the resiliency in my opinion, always comes from the inside out. Thank you. They literally just said this. The soul, as you pointed out, is in and of itself resilient for it never dies. Mm. And so even when the human cell that the soul is animating is done and the soul leaves, it is the most resilient source of energy throughout the universe. Yes. And desire with positive, pure, heart-centered belief with the light of the soul, when those three all marry together, everything will start to move in a soul chronistic fashion to continue to bridge your beliefs that you are actually here as a vessel of light in a body who is supposed to be living what your heart and soul brought you here to have. So it is like the light of the soul married with the desire, which the light always is, Mm -hmm. and getting out of your own way with your belief systems and bringing your beliefs, I know I can do this. I know there's a lesson in this. Every person I've ever loved in my whole life, my three favorite people that were on earth are now in heaven. And I have to when I and I miss them every day I love them every day and I miss them every day as a matter of fact my mom said to me she'd been gone five years now she said Edward you know you miss your mother and love your mother at the same time don't you and I said yes ma'am she said stop Mm -hmm. she said I didn't go anywhere you say mom I love you so much I miss you so much every day she's like stop You're throwing sand in the motor. And she said, love your mother like I love you because I haven't gone anywhere. And Mm -hmm. so when I miss someone I love or I feel like life has knocked me down to the bottom of the barrel again, I have to always come back and ramp up what I know that I know that I know in my soul's expression And then know what I know that I know with my desire. I know my desire is to be of service to humanity as a unifying force. Mm -hmm. And my belief is so high in that knowing that I'm batting a thousand. And when I'm batting a thousand, it's like all of that heaviness goes away, just like it goes away whenever a person is getting a reading and their loved one says something that the person on the earth plane goes, oh my God, that's really him. Mm -hmm. And then you see them light up, change up, Mm -hmm. shift up. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Eddie, that was just so mesmerizing. And I feel like, that was a reading for all of us because oh. what a beautiful concept you brought together there and and what a great um template sort of you know for how to manifest what we really want and i know you know because i'm one of those humans in that human condition sometimes the belief piece is mm-hmm. so challenging because we're so critical of ourselves Or maybe we have those hidden subconscious beliefs that we don't even know about that are blocking us, right? Yep. That's most of the time what I'm working with people on um, neutralizing are those subconscious beliefs that they don't even know they have. 
But I love how you brought that together. If we have all of those pieces in alignment, then we can create anything. We can create happiness. We can come back from even the worst of circumstances. Yes. So thank you for that beautiful map that you just drew. Thank you. And, and, oh, Eddie, thank you for everything you've shared today and the fun of being with you. I want to do this again and again and again. <laughs> no, we'll have to. And it's, we have to find a way to get you on our podcast too because the world needs the Paula unification change it up frequency. <laughs> I don't know why I just sounded like Yogi Bear. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. So I can't let you go without telling everybody about your podcast, about your books, and how to get in touch with you if they want to do a reading or learn more about your work. Uh, thank you so much. Our podcast is called Coming Out with Liz and Eddie, mm -hmm. and it's about how to come out of your psychic, spiritual, metaphysical, paranormal closet, and it's spelled <laughs> A-U-T instead of O-U-T, so it's coming out with Liz and Eddie, and it's on all of the podcast platforms everywhere, yeah. and I co-host that with Liz Lyuk, who's wonderful, <laughs> and my website is eddieconner.com, it's C-O-N-N-E-R. <laughs> because my mom says we're ers, not ors. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And on the website, it has um, how you can get an appointment if you're interested in that, or you can simply email eddieappointments at gmail.com. And the books are on there A Southern Psychic's Guide to Fix in the Big Butt Syndrome and also how to get your travel freak on too. <laughs> Oh, I love it. And I love you. And by the way, if Liz ever retires, I want to be your co-host on your podcast. <laughs> yeah. We, it's so much fun. We, I'm going to check it out. I will okay. check it out today, awesome. my friend. Awesome. Thank you for blessing us with your presence. Thank you to my listeners. Remember, you can hear us on every major podcast platform, including iHeartRadio, Blog Talk Radio. If you hear us, please share us and like us and subscribe. You know the drill. <laughs> that helps us all to keep going and helps us to know that you want more. So thank you for being here, Eddie. I love you. Thank you for being here. I love you too, Paula. Mm. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.